Thanks so much, Rich. Um, so on the panel for US exceptionalism, I feel that I am the exception because I'm not actually an Americanist. I'm a comparativist, and I've spent most of my um, research energies thus far thinking about um, election-related protests in developing countries. But where that work has taken me is to look at um, the United States, because I really believe that there are some kind of universal elements of, to bring it back to Paul's point, uh, electoral competition that give cause for concern or at least questions about election integrity across all electoral contexts. And so I am hoping to use the US case to bring kind of the US case into a comparative conversation around questions of people's perceptions of election fraud. Now, in terms of, it, practically speaking, uh, in terms of what policymakers might care about, I'm taking a step back from what our election administrators might care to know about people's perceptions of fraud. But um, perceptions of fraud in the US have been used to justify policy decisions. We have here the decision um, by the Supreme Court to uphold Arizona's voter ID law in 2006 that basically uses language that says if people think vote fraud is happening, that is akin to disenfranchising them from the process. And so there's clearly been um, a move among policymakers or those who influence policy to rely on perceptions of fraud for um, the decisions that they're making about how elections are administered in the US. And so therefore, I think it's very important that we consider how those perceptions are shaped. And so what I'm suggesting here is that partisan composition, or partisan competition, excuse me, has an important role to play in shaping, um, in shaping people's perceptions of fraud. And so one of the ways that this project takes on a more comparative flavor is I think very often in the US context, the discussions about election fraud get very narrowly centered on what comparativists would refer to as more voter fraud, things that voters can do on election day, voting multiple times, impersonating, um, et cetera, voting even though they are not eligible to vote. Um, and that is certainly the type of election fraud that Republicans have chosen to emphasize as the problem. And then consequently, the solutions that are offered from Republicans predominantly center on ways to secure polling places from this kind of fraudulent activity. But another kind of election fraud that's broadly recognized by comparative, comparativists and that get, gets emphasized by Democrats is the issue of voter suppression, simply keeping groups of people away from the polls, limiting their access. And so as a result of this emphasis, Democratic policymakers tend to focus on the ways that voting can be made easier and more accessible so that individuals are not um, excluded from the process. Now, I don't think it escapes the attention of anyone in this room that these the choice of how to problematize the question of election fraud and the solutions to offer correspond quite conveniently to um, the competitive electoral advantages or what we understand the competitive electoral advantages of the respective parties to be. So the question is then, if we give people some information um, and ask them to evaluate whether or not they think fraud has occurred, which is what I did in the 2011 Cooperative Congressional Election Study uh, with a survey experiment. The first question we might want to know about how they go about evaluating fraud is, do they try to get it right? Are they motivated by goals of accuracy? Or do they have biases that, depending on who you read, get called things like partisan goals or directional goals? The idea being, do they have preconceived notions that they're then trying to sort of reinforce in making their judgments about fraud? Or are they more trying to offer an objective assessment? And if there are these biases built into the assessment, where do those biases come from? So that's what I was trying to accomplish. And I'm actually going to breeze through the theoretical experiment or the theoretical um, components and just talk to you about what I did and what I found. I'll roll it in there. So I was able to conduct a survey experiment where the information that every one of the 1,000 respondents received was that in the 2010 elect House election in a nearby state, a candidate that was trailing in public opinion polls came from behind to win. That was the standard information that was presented to everyone. What then varied were two dimensions of experimental treatment. Um, respondents were assigned one of three potential fraud scenarios at random that I will tell you about in more detail in a moment. And then the, the party of that candidate who was trailing and came from behind to win also varied randomly was either a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate. 
After receiving this information, respondents were asked, how likely do you think it is that fraud occurred in this scenario? And were given a four-point scale from very unlikely to very likely with a somewhat on either side. Um, here are the three potential fraud scenarios that I used. Rumors of community organizers registering ineligible voters, AKA sort of a nod to ACORN. Um, and there, if we think that people are just trying to sort of accurately assess the information, what we would expect them to pick up on is what I described to you previously, that Democrats are more likely to benefit from that kind of um, electoral malfeasance. And so when, uh, when a respondent received that scenario and a Democratic candidate winning, we would expect them to be more concerned about fraud. Um, if what instead is motivating this decision is a concern that comes out of one's political ideology, then we would think that the respondent's own political identification should play a role in how they evaluate the scenario, in which case we would think of Republicans as being more concerned, if for no other reason than you know, Fox News couldn't stop talking about the ACORN situation. We would expect them to be sort of more concerned about this type of fraud, but perhaps because of you know, some um, more deeply held commitment to sort of maintaining law and order that has also caused them to gravitate toward the Republican Party in the first place. Um, the second scenario was that many voters were turned away from the polls. Here again, if it's just sort of objective accuracy, we would expect people to be more concerned when a Republican candidate comes from behind to win. If there are values involved, we might think that Democratic respondents um, would see this as more problematic. Again, in, in the last election, Melissa Harris Perry's show had a voter suppression segment once a week. So even if it's just that our Democratic respondents are watching a lot of MSNBC, they might be queuing to that message more strongly. Um, and I will say at this point that the other possibility is, goes back to what's been mentioned by Paul and Thad, that there is this, this more kind of concern with did your guy win or not. And if that's the case, then the scenarios really should be irrelevant. That what you're concerned about is the information you got about the party of the candidate that came from behind to win. And so that to just throw that out there before I before I show you my results. The third scenario was using electronic voting machines for the first time. Um, when I devised this experiment, I was thinking about uh, my time in California in the early aughts when all kinds of concerns about how electronic voting machines could be tampered with and the integrity. Um, and so that was, that was really kind of the motivation for me, including this as a possible scenario. What has turned out to be really nice in thinking about how partisanship informs people's assessment of vote fraud is that electronic voting, although there have been concerns about election integrity with electronic voting, it's never conferred a clear advantage to either party in the way it's thought about. I mean, it's kind of, you know, if you could hire someone uh, smart enough to hack into a machine, presumably either party has the resources to do that. It doesn't have that clear connection to a partisan advantage that either vote inflation or vote suppression would seem to have in the U.S. context. So first, thinking about the accuracy, if I just show you my average treatment effects for those people who chose the very likely, answered very likely for their scenario, we get a little evidence that, that respondents are trying to get it right in that our highest, our two highest proportions of concern that fraud is very likely happen when a Democrat wins um, and the scenarios that ineligible voters are being registered and when a Republican wins and the scenarios that voters turned away. So we get a little bit of evidence just sort of in the aggregate that, um, that voters are trying to assess, um, assess the information they're given in the way we as scholars would expect them to. What changes then is when we think about sort of heterogeneous effects considering individuals' own partisan identities, controlling for a number of demographic factors, gender, education, um, self-reported interest in politics, media consumption, and then I included a control question about that, um, it's interesting, Paul, it's a, it's a variation, it's one of the alternatives that you suggested. Uh, in general, how confident are you that US elections produce fair outcomes? So not the narrow, how confident are you that your ballot is counted, but a, a general confidence in the fairness of US elections. So I have that as a control as well. Um, and when, when all these factors are taken into consideration, 
in a logit regression looking at now combining variance somewhat likely versus variance somewhat unlikely. Um, here's what we see. I can show you the tables if you want, but, I, but these are more interesting. So what we see is that the consistently strongest effect on whether or not people are concerned about fraud is if they received a scenario where the winning candidate shared their partisan identity. And so I have a whole bunch, a whole host of different types of individuals, men and women across the parties and strength of partisanship varied. But, but the, the solid confidence intervals around that predicted probability are if you got a co-partisan and the dashed confidence intervals are if you got someone who, with whom you did not share partisanship. And, it works out to between a 35 and 40 percent jump um, on average in terms of concern about fraud. That is, you are 35 to 40 percent less likely to think fraud happened um, if, in the scenario you were given, if you um, receive a can if the winning candidate shared your partisanship. So it's very much consistent with the sort of real world examples of losers are more concerned. I mean, here it's a purely sort of hypothetical. It was the next state. It was, you know, sort of an unnamed, ambiguous um, individual or scenario. But what I think it suggests is that when we want to think very carefully about what we take away from individuals' perceptions of election fairness. Um, because they are clearly influenced very heavily by partisan competition and individuals' own partisan identities. And so that those, the notion of a partisan reasoning goal uh, in this context becomes literally partisan. Um, and so I think for, for policymakers, this is where to me the, the relevance for policymakers comes in, I think we want to tread very carefully in the extent to which we're basing decisions about how to administer elections on people's perceptions of fraud because they are clearly going to be so heavily influenced by partisan competition, which I mean unless we're in Paul's ideal world where we do away with that, uh, is going to be a consistent factor in these elections. So I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you. <laughs>